Hey guys, Preble1701 here, and today we're going to be ranking all of 80s Doctor Who from worst to best. So, season 18 through season 26. <clears throat> so, Tom Baker's final season, all of Davison, all of Colin Baker, and all of Sylvester McCoy. Now, going by my list, and hopefully I've got it right, we have 50 stories, 50 stories even to look at. And we're going to start with the bottom, my least favorite story of 80s Doctor Who. And it is Mind Warp. I don't like this story much. Um, I love the fact Brian Blessed is there. I like that it has Syl back. I like Syl a lot as a character. The guy who plays Syl was great, and I'm always happy to see Brian Blessed as well. I like the special effects for when they're on the surface of the planet. It has that otherworldly look to it. That's pretty cool. I love how they kidnap the Doctor. Like right when he's going to rescue Perry, that beam shoots down and pulls him into the TARDIS and pulls the TARDIS away. Because that's very reminiscent of the omnipotent God Time Lords. Like the War Game Time Lords. When they could just pluck you out and, you know, whatever. I love that. It's It's... Takes me back to old school Time Lords and not the pansy, wimpy, complainy politician Time Lords that the Deadly Assassin made them. So I like that about it, but, just, but for some reason this one just doesn't click with me. I don't like the ending with Perry. Nicholas putting in a good performance with the voice she's doing and everything, and I love how they always joke that that's just actually Nicholas' voice. That's funny. I never got much into Kiv, the other, you know, Sills boss. I never really got into him. I never liked that ending, though. I'm so glad they retconned that ending. I know some people are mad they retconned that ending and they wanted Perry to die there. I don't. One, it would have completely invalidated the Caves of Androzani. The Caves of Androzani, one of the reasons it's so good out of many, is the Doctor sacrificing himself for Perry. Killing Perry here would have negated all of that to me. Would have made that whole sacrifice utterly useless. So um, I'm glad they retconned that to where she actually survived and married Yukonos, especially since that gives us opportunities to do stuff with Nicole Bryant in the stories now, like in Tales from the TARDIS and the uh, trailer for season 22. I like the fact that we can continue with Perry's story because she lived. I love that. I absolutely love that. So yeah, I didn't like the ending with her and I didn't like the dog creature, the guy they experimented on that's kind of half man, half dog. I don't, I never... I just thought that was dumb. This story is just forgettable for me. Part of it's just I don't go back and watch it. But honestly, I find Term Terminus more memorable and better. It ranks much higher. Uh, I just I just don't get into Mind Warp. Easily the weakest of Trials of the Time Lord and easily the weakest of 80s Doctor Who for me. Next up is Delta and the Bannerman. This story's weird. Like, Doctor Who can be weird. It's Doctor Who. This story is weird. Okay, so you have the girl who is surrounded by soldiers that look like melted army soldiers, but she looks human. Then she has a baby that looks like a green baby that turns into a little girl that's sort of greenish. And then the guy... The guy who changes himself into kind of one of her people so he can be with her. You have the music that's half good and half not. I think the 50s music is good and the incidental music's bad. Or is it the other way around? I do like Riley, the other character, the one they were considering for a companion. I like her. I like some of the exchanges between her and the doctor. I do like McCoy in this one. I don't even get me started on the stuff with the bus. I've talked about the stuff with the bus a million times. I don't want to. I, I hate talking about Delta and the Bannerman it, to the point where I just it pisses me off talking about it now. Uh, but it's a stupid story. It's an overly violent story, and sometimes needlessly so, and it's just, it's just so stupid, utterly stupid, utterly dumb. I need to give it another watch through just because I've only watched it the one time, but dear God, I don't want to. Next on the list is Warriors of the Deep. Um... Now, I've only watched Warriors once, and it's pretty bad. I don't like the outfit that Davison's having to wear in a lot of it. That's nitpicky, but it bugs me. Uh, the Merca is silly looking, but not the worst thing in the world. It doesn't bother me as much as it does some people. 
the one scene with the crazy karate kick by Ingrid Pitt. <laughs> I've talked about it so many times on the channel, I'm not going to talk about it again, but it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in Doctor Who. It's absolutely hilarious. I'll just kick it. <laughs> And then the ending is atrocious. Just the, the way it ends, the literal last line before it cuts to credits is the most is one of the most eye-rolling things in Doctor Who up until we got modern Doctor Who. <laughs> modern Doctor Who has surpassed it a few times. But in classic Doctor Who, it's one of the most eye-rolling things ever. Uh, it's just a terrible, terrible ending. Uh, whew. There were better ways they could have ended that. They're really... Yeah, it should have been a better way. <laughs> I need to give it another watch through, to be fair, and I probably will once the Season 21 box set comes out, but I won't bother. I've got it on DVD, but I still won't bother until then. Next on the list is Kenda. You guys know I don't like Kenda. Kenda's just... It isn't good. I don't like it. Uh, the first half, especially. The first two episodes are terrible. And the doctor acts like an idiot. Isn't that the one where he's trying to learn how to do the trick where you pick the hand? That's what? That's so dumb. And then when she picks the right hand, he's like, are you sure? I'm like, Why is the doctor suddenly an idiot in this one? You know, when the old woman calls him idiot at one point, be quiet, idiot. I'm like, mm, I'm not even saying, yes, yes, he is. He is an idiot in this story for some reason. I don't know why, but he is. The second half is much more watchable, though, episodes three and four. I actually like the episode three cliffhanger. I like the bit right before the cliffhanger when it's all this kind of surreal scenery when, like, you're seeing things through her eyes or whatever it is. I really like the way they pull off that effect. And then the ending at episode four is pretty good. I liked it well enough. Now, the original snake model is, well. Let's just say unwatchable, because it basically is unwatchable, and it's very anticlimactic, but with the updated effects, and I will never understand these people who are like, no, I'm a purist, I must always watch the classic effects. Hey, you do you, but that's, when it comes to Kenda, that's an incredibly, I don't want to use the word stupid, because that sounds insulting, and again, you know, you do you, if you like the original effects, you like the original effects, but I can't fathom why you would want to watch the practical effect, unless you just love that cheesiness of classic, and some people do, fair enough when the CGI upgrade for that is better. And you know, I get some people not liking when they do a lot of different stuff with it, like say Day of the Daleks or something like that. But when they're doing it more just to fix things cosmetically, like Terror of the Autons where it's more clean up, same thing with Kenda. It's, I mean, it's making a CGI snake, but it's, it's the only thing they upgrade is the snake. And it's just to make that scene as climactic as it was originally intended to be. And with the CGI upgrade, I think that scene is far more effective and executes what it was trying to do with the story, to have that climactic moment. It just works way better. Um, and some of the casting in it's pretty good. I do like the older lady uh, that's in it, and then I, the guy who's kind of losing his mind. You can't mint people! I like him. He's really, really good. So, um... Not a good story overall, but uh, the second half is a lot better than the first half. Next on the list is The Awakening, which has a pretty decent first episode, but not a very good second episode. Um, I remember finishing part one and being like, mm, okay, I'm curious to see where this goes, and then finishing part two, and I was like, ah, nowhere. It went nowhere. All righty then. Um, this is another Terminus style one where it's kind of forgettable, to be honest. So I'm not going to talk about it much other than just to say I didn't really care for it. It's my least favorite of Davison's two-parters. Next on the list is The Twin Dilemma. Um, a little higher than some people might have it. It's not very good. I actually like the broad strokes of the plot. Not all the little details of the plot, but the broad strokes of the plot I like. What the main antagonist is trying to do. That's a pretty neat plan. I like uh, the guy playing the other Time Lord in the story, the Doctor's old friend. The actor playing him does a good job. I like the creature design for the main antagonist, the slug creature. I think his costume design is really good as well. Uh, <clears throat> the bad. Uh, the twins are just terrible. Just no offense to them. They're kids, but their acting is appalling. Simply terrible. Uh, a lot of the set design I don't think was overly impressive. And the sixth doctor is just... 
the sixth doctor is just appalling. I mean, Colin's theatrical acting style he does in the eighties is can be grating, and it's it's dialed up to like not even eleven. It's dialed up to like fifty three on a scale of one to ten, and it grates. But then just the way he, the doctor's written there, and then the big middle finger gives you at the end, "I am the doctor, whether you like it or not," and then he smiles at you. It's, it's like they're literally flipping you off and then making you wait nine months before you get Attack of the Cybermen, which is much better. Next on the list is Time Flight, which I like more than most, even if it's not very good. That's why it's this low. I do need to give it a rewatch. Uh, it's painfully studio bound, to, way too studio bound. Um, did they film some of it at Heathrow? I guess they must have filmed some of it at Heathrow. Mm, it deserves a rewatch. I remember the effects being not very good. The effects of the planes not being very good. The weird, it was, it's actually me, Master. Reveal of the Master is weird and doesn't need to be there. It's only there so it can have the reveal of it's actually me, Doctor. But I remember liking the story overall. Um, I don't quite remember why, but I remember finding it more enjoyable than most do. That's why it's not at the bottom. And next is Greatest Show in the Galaxy. Greatest? Greatest Show in the... And next is The Greatest Show in the Galaxy, which I did rewatch just recently and review. Uh, it has an appallingly bad first part that I can't stand. It has way too many stupid things going on. Like when they almost get hit by the car that's plainly in front of them while they're walking in the middle of the road. They should have gotten hit by the car because they deserved it. Um... Then they had a second and third part that were fine. Not really that bad. I can nitpick stuff, but also had some good stuff going on. They were fine, but weren't blowing me away. But it has a really good fourth part. And it really helps when a story can stick the landing. And Greatest Show sticks the landing perfect. Well, I don't know if there's perfectly, but it sticks the landing really well, 9 out of 10. I really like the last episode a lot. It has little things I can nitpick. But I like it a lot. It's got some really good effects after they defeat, defeat the gods of Ragnarok. So it's really hard to judge this one when my opinions of the individual episodes vary drastically with abysmal, fine, fine, really good. Um, but that's just kind of where it ends up. If you want to see more about it, then just check out the actual review because I just watched it a couple weeks ago. Next on the list is The Leisure High. Tom Baker's fourth Doctor making it into the list since his final season, season 18, is an 80s season. This one's a bit boring for me. I just never get into this one. <clears throat> this canine, first off, that opening shot that's like 90 seconds long can put me to sleep. It's too long. Canine blowing himself up in the water is incredibly stupid. Uh, I don't like the costume design for any of the aliens. The guys with the little bells or the lizards, they just look laughably bad. The cliffhanger where the doctor splits apart, that looks so bad. That looks so, maybe it was impressive for the time, but my God, it's aged badly. Uh, it's watchable though. I mean, it is perfectly watchable. It's, you know, I'd rather watch it than Power of Troll, but I think when I was ranking the fourth Doctor era, this was second from the bottom for me. I just, watchable, but just not that interesting. Next on the list is Black Orchid. Uh, I love the location work, which is, of course, the film ele elements survive for all of season 19, so it looks really good. Uh, the cast is doing fine. Um, watching Davison play cricket's fun. The rest of it, I don't care for. I don't. I never like when they're when the Doctor has someone that either looks like just like them, or a companion has someone that either looks just like them, unless it's makes sense for the plot like Megalos does. It just annoys me where the main actor is having to play two characters just because it's a coincidence that that always annoys me. Um, even at two parts, I find this one too long. Even at two parts, I'm like, dear God, isn't it over yet? And I rather enjoyed listening to the audio commentary for this one from TARDIS Team 5 because they didn't seem too impressed with it either. And if they're not impressed with it, why should I be? Next on the list is Full Circle. Full Circle is an interesting one. It's one that I always have a higher opinion of fresh off a rewatch. 
uh, when it's been a while since I've seen it, like now, it it's kind of a middling story, but usually when I come off of a fresh rewatch of it, I have more of an appreciation of it. Uh, it's another one that's just kind of forgettable, but it has elements I like in it. I like how it deals with the evolution themes and stuff. I forget exactly how they work, but it's there. Uh, some of the location stuff looks good. Uh, there's something else I like about it. The bit the Dr. Fiant figures out how they're assembling and disassembling the ship at the same time. I like how he points that out. And it's a clever thing they have in there. I like, I don't like Romana being controlled by the Beatles because the whole companion being controlled some way by something is just tropey at this point and always annoys me. Uh, it's a mixed bag, but fresh off a rewatch, it would probably be higher. Next on the list is Planet of Fire. And to be fair, I may be a little biased because the last time I watched it, I watched the special edition. And this is one of those rare occasions where the original version's better than the special edition. Special edition's watchable, but it was unnecessary. Uh, I don't think Planet of Fire needed a special edition. The original version is better. Uh, it's fine. I mean, the whole bit about the master being shrunk down and needing to use chameleons a bit silly. But it's there. And then I just don't like Chameleon. Like, I... I <sighs> ew. I really don't like Chameleon. Uh, and I much prefer him in King's Demons when he's not used as much as here, where he's just irritating. Uh, Planet of Fire is decent. That's all I'll give it. Which is odd, because I tend to like Fiona's directing directed stories. Fiona was a great director for Doctor Who. And next is Survival, the final story of classic Doctor Who, which, to be fair, I think gets some points from people just because it is the final story for classic Doctor Who. Um, judging it on its own merits, I love McCoy's performance in it. I love Sophie's performance in it. It's Anthony Ainley's best performance as the Master, in my opinion. I love the fact, I love having the Seventh Doctor against the Master. I wish we'd gotten more episodes of that because I love Chess, Chess Master McCoy going up against the Master. I would love to have seen more of that somehow uh, because that's really a Doctor who can go toe to toe with the Master. Um, the story didn't grab me that much. The Puss in Boots looks, which I know is not what the writer wanted, really doesn't work for me. The the fake cat really doesn't work for me. Um, McCoy going into his falsetto voice close to the climax doesn't quite work for me. Uh, it's a mixed bag. It's, it's just a mixed bag. Next on the list is Maldron Undead, which is good. Um, it's not perfect, uh, but I like it. I've talked about it, I believe, recently as well. I don't like the outfits that Maldron and his people wear, these weird hippie-looking outfits, and they have the little brain things. Ugh, I, that, 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 I just don't want to look at the screen when they're on screen. I'm like, mm, no, mm, mm. it just bothers me. It's great having the Brigadier back. I love the idea of having two Brigadiers there, and Nicholas Courtney plays them slightly differently just to show the difference between him freshly retired and him kind of used to more civilian life and how he dresses and his mannerisms. That's really good acting on his part. Uh, I kind of like Tegan and Nissa getting a little to do in it. Of course, everything going on with Turlow and the Black Guardian and Vincent, uh, no, Vincent, Valentine. Valentine is just so good as the Black Guardian. He just has that cool voice. Uh, and I love the updated effects for it. It's another one where the updated effects do help it. And, uh, yeah, I like the interior of the ship as well. The interior of the ship kind of reminds, kind of like, um, Robots of Death. Instead of looking all Nostromo-like, it has that more luxurious look to it, which I like. Next on the list is Terminus. Uh, Terminus is very forgettable, but it's better than people remember it being. It's not like a masterpiece. It's not essential Doctor Who. It's probably the least interesting of the three Black Guardian stories. The updated effects help it a lot. I noticed that when I was watching, um, I think Dan the Man's comparison video with the old effects for it and the new effects for it. And Dan does, has a great YouTube channel, by the way. Uh, the updated effects for it are really good. They're really impressive. They really help the story, I think. I love the 
what basically reminds me of the steel suits from Dune, the 1984 Dune, which we'll just refer to as the good one. Um, uh, I really like those steel suits a lot, so I kind of like the outfits they're wearing there. Uh, the story itself is it's okay. I mean, it could be a little boring. There is too much time with Turlo and Tegan spent running around in the uh, the little floorboard areas, the crawl spaces. That that takes a little too long, but but I enjoy it. Plus, I love the dog thing. I like his outfit, the little dog creature running around. I like him. So I actually like Terminus. It's a story that every time I rewatch it, I tend to appreciate it a little more. And next we're gonna talk about Snake Dance. Snake Dance is so much better than Kenda. I will never understand anyone who likes Kenda better. Uh, Snake Dance I like. Is Snake Dance great? I, I think great's too much of a stretch, but it's good. Uh, Nissa is utterly useless in it. I feel bad for Nissa because this is like her second to the, well not second, but her third to the last story. First off, I don't like that outfit they put her in. Secondly, she just feels useless. The only thing she's given to do the whole story is pretty much keep up with Tegan and she bungles it. Uh, Tegan is great. Janet Fielding gets, puts in a good performance playing the Mara again, and she gets more time with it here. We have Martin Clunes in his first TV role. He's putting in a really good performance. Um, <clears throat> I like Davison. Davison's having some good stuff here to do with the jewel, which I really like. I like the old guy who stays in the desert, even though he doesn't talk, I like him. My biggest complaint about uh, Snake Dance is just the the ending being cut because there is an extended ending that got cut out of the final broadcast. Uh, and I love that ending. It's really good. And it's not, you can't even watch it on the box set. Uh, you can only watch it as a bonus feature. Cause I think the original footage of it doesn't survive. And it's only like a lesser like work print version of it that survives kind of like with ghost light. But I wish they would have at least given me the option to watch it with that added at the end. I would have been fine with that. Again, like Ghostlight, I'd have been fine with that. But they don't even have the option for that. But it's such a better ending to me. Also, I think the original snake effect looks good in Snake Dance. Uh, the updated effect looks good too. But I thought the original one works pretty well. I liked Snake Dance. Next on the list is The Ultimate Foe. Um... Yeah, basically Colin's last story, and the last story, at least partially written by the great Bob Holmes, who of course wrote part one. Uh, part one is better than part two. It's a great cliffhanger with the doctor sinking into, well, what honestly looks like oatmeal to me, but <laughs> uh, but it's it's neat. Uh, Michael playing the Valleyard so well really helps here. I enjoy part two for what it is, especially knowing all the behind the scenes drama and knowing they had to go into it blind, basically. I think they did well enough, even if I do feel like the Valley Art is defeated a little too easily. <clears throat> and the little cliffhanger of him at the end feels a little unnecessary, but whatever. Uh, but I like it well enough. Um, and it's great having Glitz back. I like Glitz. Next on the list is Frontios. I like Frontios. It's a dark story. Davison really gets to actually be a doctor in this one, helping injured and wounded. I really love Davison's performance in this story. It's one of his best performances, in my opinion. Uh, I think the companions are putting in a good job. We get a little bit of backstory on Turlo and his people, although it's a little confusing at first. Like, I'm trying to figure out why is this dude freaking out? He doesn't strike me as the cowardly type, but then you get the backstory about him, his people facing the Tractators before. The Tractators' actual costume design, I, Sometimes I like it, sometimes I think it's terrible. It's just one of those. Um, them as a villain, yeah. I can see why they thought about bringing them back. Kind of glad they didn't. Loved the machine that's ran by plugging someone into it. That's just creepy. Some of that 20, season 21 darkness creeping in. And it's pulled off very effectively in the story. Plus the fact they can just pull you under the ground like that. There's a lot of scary, creepy stuff going on in Frontios. And... Um, I like it. It's a good story. Next, we're going to talk about Terror of the Vervoids. I enjoyed this one. Uh, the plants being deadly. I'm not a big fan of the plant design and that unfortunate, unfortunate plant face design that once you see, you, you can't unsee. Uh, but the story I enjoy. I actually like the story. 
it, and them being on a luxury liner in space, there's really no way to get away. They're just kind of trapped there for the most part. Uh, then you have the B plot of the guy who's disguising himself as hiding because he doesn't want anyone finding him, even though someone does. Uh, the one security guard who's on the take, as I recall. I like the fact the captain and the doctor are old friends. I enjoyed that, even if the captain's a little annoyed by him. I prefer the trialless version with the updated effects. The updated effects aren't really that big of an improvement to me, but um, I enjoy them well enough, and I do prefer the trialless version because I prefer this as a standalone story. Um, the scene when they find the one woman who's like half verboid is pretty chilling and creepy. I actually like it. Uh, I still think they should have had some kind of plan in place if one of those things got free, though. And the one woman, the older woman, I know the actress is a famous actress, uh, her death was so unnecessary. I have to at least try, we know who you are, <clears throat> and then they kill her, and I don't know. It just seems kind of wasted. So it's a, it's, it's a mixed bag, but I like it overall. Next on the list is Silver Nemesis. I enjoyed my last watch through a Silver Nemesis, which was recent, actually. Uh, someone sent it to me. Uh, either Lance or Simon sent it, one or the other. Um, I think Simon sent it, which I appreciate. It was good to rewatch it. I had only seen it once before. And one of its major problems is there is a little too much going on with so many factions the Doctor's going up against with the witch from the past, the... Uh, people who think they're Germans in World War II, and uh, the Cybermen, of course, who should be the main antagonist. So there's a little too much going on there. Uh, the witch who can travel around in time, although it does kind of explain why she can do that, because she has the arrow, then the Neo guys have the bow. I love how the Doctor steals the bow and they don't realize it. I like this. The Cybermen in this one, their outfits, are like the worst of 80 Cybermen. I don't actually mind the chrome, but their their body suits look worse. And then they're wearing the weirdest gloves Cybermen have ever worn. They look like they're about to go play a game of catch at the ballpark. They're these thick gloves that just, I, I laugh every time I see them. I can't take it seriously. Like anytime I see like a close up of those gloves, I'm just going, <laughs> I can't take it seriously. How do you how do you hold anything with those things? <laughs> He's out. I caught it. Oh, it's ridiculous. But the story I enjoy. The special effects are fine. Uh, the idea of the Silver Nemesis is pretty cool. I mean, let's be honest. This is kind of just a rehash of Remembrance of the Daleks, with Remembrance of the Daleks being the way better story. But it's it's fine, and I enjoy it. Uh, the effect for Nemesis looks pretty pretty decent. It could use some updated effects, but I think it's fine. And um, I like when the witch is like threatening to reveal the doctor's secrets and the doctor's just like, eh, go ahead. There, there's a little bit of foreshadowing there for, you know, an answer we never got, thankfully, because I don't like the Cartmel master plan. It's a good story with some flaws. Next on the list is Time and the Rani, probably higher than a lot of people would have it. Uh, once again, knowing all of the behind-the-scenes stuff that this that went on and all the problems this story had, I cut it a little bit of slack. I think it's fine. It's got some humor in it I like. I actually like the Seventh Doctor mixing up his metaphors and playing the spoons, including on Katie O'Mara, which is hilarious. Um, I think he's putting in a good performance. I love when I get to watch a new Doctor run around in his previous incarnation's outfit for a little bit like he does here. Um... Kate O'Mara looks like she's having a blast, and that's always fun. She just looks like she's having so much fun. Uh, these special effects are actually pretty impressive in some places, like the little balls that crash into mountains. It's pretty cool. When the TARDIS is getting shot down at the beginning for the time, I think that was pretty impressive. Had it hasn't aged the best, but pretty impressive. Uh, the little bees that are in the thing look pretty bad. The bees look bad when they're in the little central. Yeah, that, that looks bad. Uh, and then some of the incidental music I really liked as well. The makeup for the aliens with the scales looks really good. And then the, uh, the, the Tetra bats or whatever they're called, their costume design looks really impressive. There's a lot of interesting good things going on in Time of the Ronnie. It might not be the best story, but it's better, I think, than it's given credit for. Especially knowing all the stuff behind the scenes. 
And next on the list is Legopolis, Tom Baker's final story. I'd love to rank this one higher. I just can't. I do think the upgraded effects help it, especially adding in the actual footage shot at what Jordan Banks or wherever the place is supposed to be, where they wanted to shoot originally but couldn't. I love the fact they got the drone footage to where they could edit that in in the background instead of having to use the model prop. Uh, I think that's a lot better seeing Tom actually fall. Just adds a little bit to it to me. Uh, I think Anthony Angley puts in a good performance. I think it's pretty neat we just kind of see him in shadow or from a first person perspective at first and hear him kind of laughing. He's kind of creepy there. But I think he's putting in a good performance. I think Tom puts in a good performance. Uh, and you really have this feeling of everything's on the line with this one. Everything, you know, the doctor's final battle and you know, his past catching up with him. It just, it, it really does feel like he's giving it everything he's got. Uh, and it's a great introduction for Tegan as well. I like Tegan a lot. But I don't know. I just feel like the fourth doctor should have went out on an even better story. The stuff with the Watcher is a little weird. Uh, that That's still a little weird, everything with the Watcher. And how much foreshadowing does the doctor know that he's about to die? It's, it's a little weird. Um, set design doesn't really impress me with it either. Uh, I don't know. Just kind of a middle of the road, easing into good episode, honestly. Next on the list is Vengeance on Veros, which usually I rank higher. For some reason, my last watch through of this just didn't impress me as much as usual. Uh, the Perry turning into the bird thing is always a little weird too, but Sill's great in it. Uh, the cliffhanger for episode one is really good with the doctor looking like he's dying. That's a great cliffhanger. The effect of the desert over the hallway looks really impressive. Um, I love the fact it predicts reality TV, you know, years before reality TV. Um, I do feel like, was it Sean Connery's son and his wife are just wasted in it, just wasted, like there's no point in them being there. Uh, usually I have a higher opinion of it than I did on the last watch through. Next on the list is Revelation of the Daleks. This is a good one. I like Cullen's Necros cloak. I love the assassin and uh, his partner. They're both really cool. Uh, I don't really care for, was it Ellen Braun or whatever her name is? I mean, she's all right in it. She's, she's not bad in it. But her assistant, the one that takes like 30 seconds to die after he got shot. Eh. <laughs> I, I almost was expecting him to finish his drink before he fell over. Um, the, it, it's kind of the first time we see a flying Dalek, even if it's executed badly. The updated special effects for that really... This is another one that the updated special effects really do help this one a lot. Uh, I love the fake out with Davros and how he's not really the head in the jar. I love that scene when he's shooting Scorzani or whatever his name is with his finger to knock him down. Uh... This is a very violent one. This is a very, very violent story, but I love it. I, I love the violence in it. I like the woman who's trying to save her father and the guy with her. I like the little B-plot going on with them, even though it doesn't end well for them. I love the stuff with the glass Dalek. That glass Dalek effect is so cool. And seeing her dad half transformed, that's really creepy. Like David Cronberg level, well, maybe not quite that, but close level stuff. It's just creepy. Um, I enjoy that a lot. The stuff with the guy who runs the funeral parlor and the girl that's like obsessed with him bores me. And it's not that I don't like Clive Swift. Isn't that, I believe it's Clive Swift. Uh, I like him a lot as an actor and I love when he showed up in Boys of the Dam. And he's putting in a good performance just like the, the girl that's obsessed with him. He's putting in a good performance. It's just the material itself feels wasted it, it just feels drawn out and doesn't need to be there and i'm like can i get a version of this where that's just cut out because i don't want it it just it just drags for me although i do love the fact when she kills clive swift's character when he falls down his little toupee falls off something about that just amuses me because he strikes me as a very vain fellow i just find that kind of amusing that as he dies his toupee fell off that, that's just funny to me oh yeah the dj i, I, I have nothing against what alexi is that his name alexi uh, 
I don't know this guy, but apparently he was a popular personality and people seem to have liked him, but I just don't care for the DJ character. It's another one that just feels like excess and doesn't need to be there. Plus his death's kind of silly. He could have stayed down there. He's like, ha-ha, I killed one. Ha-ha, I killed another one. I'll just walk out calmly. Oh, there was a third one. That wasn't thought through very well by the writers, by the director, by anybody. Next on the list is Earthshock. Uh, Earthshock is a classic, rightfully so. It is a great story. It's a great reintroduction to the Cybermen. That episode of One Cliffhanger is phenomenally good. Phenomenally good. Especially with the Cybermen being gone for so long. <clears throat> it's a great updated cyber design. David Banks is always amazing as the cyber leader. The uh, episode one bits that take place in the caves and right outside the caves is really good. Really good at setting up what's going on. I like the android design that are running around in the caves. I like the actors playing the soldiers in it. I think they're really neat. I do like the updated effects a lot. You guys know I love my up updated laser beams and we do get some nice updated laser beams. The updated shots of the ship crashing into the earth really is much better than that original static shot of the ship blowing up. I like that better. Um, it killing off a companion with Adric is nice. One, just because it killing off a companion didn't happen much in Classic Who, and two, because it's Adric. <laughs> uh, and then how it ties it in with being the crash that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs to create, basically, or to cause man to rise up and take control of the planet. That's really neat. And how they even tie it in with 10th Planet, how they're trying to crash it in in 1985 to prevent Monda. Or is that, or am I confusing that with Attack of the Cybermen? Yeah, I think they do that in Attack of the Cybermen to crash it in. It gets really confusing because sometimes these stories are so similar. But I still think that's uh, neat that the ship crashing is what causes the extinction of the dinosaurs. It's a good story. Earthshock has a very epic feel to it. I also like the set design a lot. And I actually like uh, what Bernice or whatever her, her name is, the woman who played the captain. Some people criticize that casting sometimes. I actually like her in the role myself. I thought she was great. Earthshock deserves most of the accolades it gets. But to be fair, Revenge of the Cyberman deserves some of those as well. Because let's just be honest, Earthshock's pretty much the same plot as Revenge of the Cybermen. Next on the list is Attack of the Cybermen, which is also really good. Um, I believe they're trying to crash Telos into Earth before the events of 10th Planet, which take place in 1986, to prevent the destruction of Mondas. So that's cool how they're tying it in with the old lore. Uh, I like the B-plot with the guys who work in the cyber camp who are trying to get free and the reveal that they've already been partly converted. I like the stuff going on with them. It's a shame they don't make it out. But uh, season 22 is a dark season. Uh, Colin is already much better in the role here. The Sixth Doctor is written much better here. I tend to like the location work. I love the bit with them trying to fix the chameleon circuit. That's funny. I love having Lytton back. Uh, Lytton's great in the story. I also love that we really get a horrifying look at just how scary cyber, ver cyber conversion can be uh, with Lytton fighting to hold on at the end, willing to sacrifice himself to help. That's a pretty nice peek into cyber conversion. The bit when he's basically getting his hands smashed, which isn't as gruesome as I'd heard about, but for the time, for TV, BBC, I'm sure that's pretty gruesome. Uh, yeah, I like a lot of the stuff going on in Attack of the Cybermen. Uh, I've only watched it the one time. It does need a rewatch, but I really liked it. And next, we're going to talk about Dragonfire. You guys know I like Dragonfire. It's a great introduction to Ace. I think it's got really good set design. I like Kane as a villain. I think he has a really impressive death. I think that's a pretty neat effect for classic Doctor Who. Very Raiders of the Lost Ark. You have, uh, what's it, Patricia O'Quinn from, uh, uh, isn't that her name? Lady Stevens from the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which I love the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, and the... I mean, it deals with the nature of slavery, even if it doesn't deal with it as heavy-handed as it could have. Uh, I like how it subverts the trope of alien by making the alien, it's very obviously based on alien, a benign creature. 
Uh, I, I like it for the most part. And, it, and mail goes away, which is really nice. Um, and it's got glitz in it, and I like glitz a lot. I love, I love the fact glitz interacts with two incarnations of the Doctor in his run. I really like the way Tony played glitz. It has flaws, which I've talked about in other videos. The Sylvester remembering to slide around when no one else is, for example. Uh, the cliffhanger that's literally a cliffhanger for no reason. Um, and the whole thing that Glitz basically sold his crew into slavery where they got brainwashed. And that's kind of just glossed over. <laughs> because he's the love of a rogue type, so everybody just forgives him. <laughs> so it's got its issues, but it, it's a good, fun story. Next on the list is The Visitation. I like this one. It's got a really nice little twist ending. The location work looks gorgeous because, again, all the film elements survive. Looks really good. I love the guy playing the kind of mercenary character a lot. He's awesome. Adds a lot to it. The robot looks really good when uh, he's dressed up like the Grim Reaper and really awful when he's not. It's one of those you're watching this going, ah, this was made in the 80s. Uh, the lizard designs are okay. I mean, like, sometimes I want to think they look pretty good. Sometimes I think they look a bit naff, but they're okay. I like how we saw the opening, the family trying to fight them off. And even though we don't see what happens to them, you know it doesn't end well for them. It's just a well-put-together episode. And Nissa actually gets stuff to do by blowing up the robot. And I like when Nissa gets stuff to do. And next is Battlefield. I like Battlefield. The worst part of Battlefield is the incidental music. The incidental music, not only is it not good, it just feels out of place. It doesn't match what's going on on the screen. I really wish someone would rescore. <sighs> I really wish someone would rescore Battlefield. It really needs it. Uh, it's great having the Brigadier back. I also love Brigadier Bombera as well. The actress playing her does such a good job with her. Uh, I wouldn't want to cross her. The uh, Gene Marsh is doing a great job as Morgaine in it. Uh, the speech at the end when the doctor convinces her not to use the missile when he appeals to her honor is a great speech. One of McCoy's best, very probably the most underrated speech in all of Doctor Who from the doctor, actually. And the fact that Morgaine is written as this more three-dimensional character in the sense that she does have that sense of honor, which I like. And how it combines Arthur legend with sci-fi Doctor Who with them being from another planet and crossing dimensions and how it ties in with the Arthur legend. It's really, really neat. Um, <clears throat> it has a couple other moments that irks me, like again, when McCoy is telling them to stop fighting and he goes into that, there will be no battle here, I command it. And he's doing it in that falsetto voice where it just comes across as pulling me out of the story. It just feels so fake. Because I've heard McCoy yell in real life, like he does it in Silver Nemesis one time with his actual voice, and when he saved Sophie's life in real life by telling them to get her out of there. I've watched that footage as well. Uh, he has a really good yelling voice, but sometimes just as an actor, he goes into that fake voice, which is, it pulls me out of the scene. Uh, but Battlefield, for the most part, is a good story. Next on the list is Paradise Towers. This is a good one. I need to rewatch this one. I've only watched it the one time, but I do enjoy it. It is dark. It's dealing with a dark subject matter that I think people might miss because it's shot in that overlit season 24 style that you know, we have to get away from the darkness of season one and 22, so we're going to do lighthearted stuff, but we're really not. He, he, he. Because they're still dealing with dark material, cannibalism, um, people getting pulled down, garbage disposals, people, you know, a machine say hungry, uh, a body possession and body horror. Uh, there, there's a lot of heavy themes in Paradise Towers. It's just the way it's shot is in a much lighter like, Graham Williams style. But if you pay attention, it, it, it's a dark story. I like Paradise Towers. It needs a rewatch. <clears throat> Next on the list is Time Lash, which is probably higher than most would have it. It's up here for a couple of reasons. One, Paul Darrow is great in it. I love Paul Darrow in this. It, it's really weird for me because I talk about Paul Darrow 
like I have some kind of nostalgic attachment to him. Like I've grown up being this huge Blake 7 fan. But I haven't. And I don't. So I don't know why I'm always like, Paul Darrow's in this great, because this is the main thing I know Paul Darrow from. And I just watched it when the set came out. I have no nostalgic attachment to Paul Darrow, but I act like I do, and I don't know why. I don't know why. Now, I've seen episode, the first two episodes of Blake 7, which he's not in the first one, and he shows up in the second one. And when he shows up in the second one, I'm all excited, like, Paul Darrow, yeah, why? I don't know why. I'm treating, I treat Paul Darrow for some reason like, like I watched him as a child, like, like I do other actors I like, like, say, Burgess Meredith, who I absolutely love Burgess Meredith, even though I don't care for the Rocky movies. And while I liked the Adam West Batman as a kid, I don't watch it now. It's more his Twilight Zone stuff I love him from because he's in literally both of my two favorite episodes of the Twilight Zone. Uh, I have an affinity for Burgess Meredith because I have the same kind of odd affinity for Paul Darrow, even though there's no realistic reason why I should, but he's one of the reasons I love this episode. And just watching him chew the scenery, I've famously heard that he's, he's not playing his character, he's playing Richard III playing his character, basically, or he's playing his character like he's playing Richard. It's really funny. And he's great at it. He's just chewing the scenery. And uh, because of this, when, he's, when I watched episode two of Blake 7, I was excited when he showed up. So it's really weird to have that kind of an affinity for an actor where for, with no legitimate reason to have that kind of an affinity for an actor. But I like him. I just inherently like him. He's got a really cool voice. And then the updated effects really help it. I've never watched it all the way through with the original effects. Now, I've seen Dan's videos comparing the two. And those original effects look pretty abysmal, let's be honest. But I've never just watched it all the way through with the original effects. That might be hard going. But the updated effects on the box set look really good, a big improvement, especially the scene when he's in the time lash. looks much better, even though it still goes on way longer than it needs to. Even with the updated effects, I'm sitting there going, all right already. The best way they could have done that for the special edition of it would have been to cut that scene by about two-thirds, make it about a third as long as it normally is, would have been good. But with those things taken in mind, plus the fact the Borad makeup looks really good, plus it's just, it's got H.G. Wells in it, and I love that, uh, I think it's a pretty fun story to watch. Next on the list is The King's Demons. I like this one. My favorite Davison two-parter. I love it being said in the past. I love the guy playing the king or the guy who's supposed to be the king. It, it just, I just love how he plays the king. He's so good. Again, he's a little hammy with it, but I love how he's doing it. I love the little song he sings and plays at one point. It's really fun. Uh, some of the guest cast are good. Some of the guest cast I don't care for. Um, Anthony Ainley is good as the master. Uh, <clears throat> Although, when we first see Anthony Ainley, it's very obvious it's Anthony Ainley. You know, you see him in disguise and you're just like, that's Anthony Ainley. I had already known the master was in the story before I saw it. But when I saw it, I was just like, yep, that's Anthony Ainley. And of course, the cliffhanger, of course, because it's only a two-part, the cliffhanger is, it's actually me, Dr. <laughs> I'm like, oh, again, they do that a lot in the Fifth Doctor era. Uh, I love the sword fight at the end of part one. It's a great physical battle between them, even if it does look a little choreographed. I like it. And then I like how in part two at the end, they have a mental battle when they're trying to co control Chameleon. So you get to see them physically fight, and you get to see them mentally fight. I uh, enjoy that as well. I think it's a really good underrated story. Next on the list is The Mysterious Planet, my favorite season 23 story. Uh, the robots look a little naft, but I enjoy the story itself. I like Glitz and Dibber a lot. I always, I'm always, i always happy to see Glitz, so I'm happy to have Glitz and Dibber a lot. I like that Perry and the Doctor, their friendship seems a little less heated now, a little more friendly, where they can have a more friend, friendly banter, where there's not quite as much the Doctor being snippy with her like in season 22. I kind of wish we'd gotten more with them in season 23, honestly. Uh, I love the reveal that they're actually on Earth. That's a really nice little reveal. Um, the incidental music is also really good in this story. I really, really uh, enjoy the incidental music in the story a lot. Next on the list is Remembrance of the Daleks. 
Ooh, this one's gonna get me in trouble because I think most people would have this one higher. I like Remembrance. It's good. It's a bit overrated. It has things I nitpick, like that little children's song that plays every time that little girl shows up and drives me bonkers. The little girl herself, the actress playing her, is doing a good job because sometimes she just comes across as a creepy little girl, the way she can just stare sometimes. Um, the Dalek blast effects look a little odd because they're not shooting beams, they're shooting projectiles, and they look like they're trying to be made for 3D television. I do love the fact that the blasts are different colors for the two factions. One shoots the traditional green blast, one has an orange blast. I love the idea of a Dalek Civil War. The fact that one group of Daleks has changed so much they're not considered pure Daleks anymore, basically. And to see that, I, I like the Daleks having a Civil War. I just love that. I love the fact Revolution of the Daleks went back to that. Uh, and to see them fighting is cool. I love the, uh, you know, like the Master Weapons Dalek or whatever it's called. I can't remember at the moment. I love that thing with a big cannon. I just, I love that thing. It's so cool. Uh, the reveal of. It tricks you into thinking Davros is when one faction when he's actually revealed to be the Emperor Dalek. That's really cool. Watching Sylvester McCoy kind of show Chess Master McCoy for the first time at the end. That whole conversation he has with Davros is just fantastic. I love that. Great performance from Sylvester McCoy and Al finding out how he manipulates them into destroying Scarrow, supposedly. I mean, we see it later, but whatever. Um, good story. Uh, it does take the, the Dalek way too long to get up the stairs at the beginning of part two. Like, I think they're actually having tea while it's coming up the stairs. It takes it way too long to get up the stairs and then destroy the wooden door. It's like laughably too long, let's be honest. And other little things I can nitpick, but it is a good story. Next on the list is Resurrection of the Daleks, my favorite of the 80s Dalek stories. Needs updated effects. That's the main thing I can remember right now. Needs some updated effects. I love the darkness of the story. It famously has more deaths than the Terminator. Uh, there's a lot of fighting and battling that desperately need updated effects going on. I like that. I enjoy the guest cast. I love watching the Daleks slaughter the people to get to Davros. I like Davros already up to his own games, manipulating people to his side while well, using his little thing to make people on his side. Um, it's been a while since I watched it. It needs a fresh rewatch. Uh, hopefully with updated effects. Next is Enlightenment. I enjoy Enlightenment. It's kind of the jewel of season 20 outside of Five Doctors. It's a really neat story. It's very Doctor Who in that it's out there. I like, and it's really hard to explain, but I like what it does. I like the idea of the Eternals and how they're basically just bored but how they kind of rely on human minds to exist, to feel the emotions and life experiences we feel, how they, how to, how they kind of live through that vicariously almost. Uh, all three versions of this look good. The original 1983 version has some pretty good model effects. The uh, 2023 updated effects on the season 20 box set look really good. And I also really enjoy the 2009 movie length edit with its updated effects. Not a big fan of the the 16.9 widescreen format it uses, but other than that, I like it. I actually prefer its updated effects over the 2023 updated effects for the most part. Uh, a good story. I like the casting. I really like the, the uh, Linda, is that her name? The pirate captain. She's really, really good. Uh, the actors playing the captain of the main ship they're on, they're really good at being very emotionless, while the one that likes Tegan's really interesting in how he plays. Uh, this fascination he has for Tegan, which at the, on one hand can seem a little creepy, but on the other hand almost has this childish innocence to it because he doesn't realize he's being a little creepy like he was raised on John Hughes movies and doesn't know better. Uh, Davison's putting in a good performance. Uh, Janet Fielding is putting in a good performance. Uh, Mark is putting in a good performance. We see Mark uh, really coming into his own here. Uh, still being a kind of selfish character, but at the end he does the right thing to get rid of the Black Guardian. And of course I love Valentine as the Black Guardian. He's always great as the Black Guardian. Um, I don't really care for the outfits they have the Black Guardian or the White Guardian in with the weird hair things. But other than that, they're, they're good performances. Enlightenment is a lot of fun. It's a well-written well story uh, and it's executed well visually. 
Next on the list is another one that's going to get me in trouble because it's in 14th place, and that is the Caves of Androzani. Now, the Caves of Androzani is objectively one of the best Doctor Who stories. Like, just the structure of it, how it's executed. I mean, it's Bob Holmes firing on all cylinders. It is Peter Davison's best performance in the role as well. If I was doing this list completely objectively, it would be near the top. But I don't go back and re-watch Caves a lot. Uh, Caves is kind of like Genesis. It's a fine wine. It's top shelf. I just take it down and give it a viewing every now and then when I'm in the mood for it. Um, but there's just other stories on this list that I enjoy more. So it comes down more to my subjective taste in the stories I like to go back and rewatch that have more of a rewatchability to it. Uh, and that's why it ranks here. It's a good story. I mean, other than the little bat creature looking a bit naff, let's be honest, but it's not on the screen long. long. Uh, it's nice to get some more of Perry with Five, because I actually like the dynamic with Perry and Five. Uh, again, Davison's putting in such a good performance. The location work looks nice. The casting, for the most part, is good. The guy playing Morgus, or whatever his name is, is a little over the, he's a little hammy sometimes, and his, I must do something about this. They must suspect something. That looking at the camera is a little bothersome, but I do love how he does that bit when he's like, how sad. I love that bit. I love how he does that. Because you can tell he doesn't think it's sad at all. Uh, I love the fact that there's no good faction in this, really. Uh, I mean, no one is necessarily evil, not evil like, Evil, evil. They're just not good people. I mean, you have Jack, but you can understand why he's the way he is because that guy's been through a lot. Like, Jack is Jack is played really well by the actor who plays him, and he's written really, really well and directed really well as this very sympathetic character. Like, he, you can understand why he's the way he is. He's not a good person at this point, uh, but you can understand why because it, he's, ooh, he's been through a lot, Jack. So he's sympathetic. You have the military people who are trying to kill Jack, the guy with the little thin mustache, who's just kind of doing a job. He just has kind of a no-nonsense way to do it. He follows orders. He's a military man who follows orders. Um, his second-in-command, who the actor playing him is playing the second-in-command and the robot. I like him. He seems like a good guy. He's just he's in the military. He's doing his military stuff. Uh, then you have, like, the mercenaries who definitely are not good people. Again, not inherently evil. They just, they have no uh, conscience. You know, they do what they do because that's what they're paid to do. And then Morgus, or whatever his name is, who, you know, is that stereotypical capitalist businessman who just wants more power and more money. So it's not like they're evil like the Black Guardian evil. They're just not good people inherently. These people can exist in real life. These aren't the... You know, beings from the dark dimension type, evil, evil. You know, these aren't like demons or anything. They're actual people. People like this exist in the real world. They're just people driven by their own selfish desires and ambitions to one degree or another. But the doctor doesn't have a side he can rally on here because there aren't any really good sides. His main goal is he just needs to get out of there. Um, he, you know, he needs to get him and Perry out of there. And I love... Uh, the ending when he sacrifices his own life to save Perry, who he barely knows at this point. It's executed really well. And the episode three cliffhanger is one of the best, best cliffhangers. I can understand why Caves has the reputation it does. It is a objectively strong, well-made story. It's only this low because the other 13 are, I just personally, subjectively find more enjoyable. Which brings us to Warrior's Gate. I like Warrior's Gate. I like the story of Warrior's Gate. Again, it has a very Doctor Who feel to it. It's executed really well on screen. I've talked before about how Warrior's Gate is a story that is going to look different depending on what decade it is made in. And this is how the 80s tackles Warrior's Gate. I really like it. It has this surreal feel to it. This almost clash between sci-fi and fantasy feel to it that's executed really well. Uh, some of the crew members on the other ship have very two-dimensional feels, including the captain. They don't really get fleshed out as much for me. The new novelization, Warriors Gate Beyond, fleshes them out better, in my opinion. Uh, Tom's putting in a good performance. 
Lala's putting in a good performance. Her, her goodbye is a little quick, but it's effective. It works for me. The same thing with him leaving K9 behind. I love some of the effects, like Tom going through the mirror, uh, walking around when he's inside the mirror. I, I really like the special effects in this story a lot. Uh, learning about how the falls themselves used to be, you know, kind of the rulers of everything before they got relegated to servant status and how their empire was toppled and seeing, you know, their past and like when Tom sees the banquet hall get destroyed and then it turns back to the future where it's all wrecked. I really like a lot of Warrior's Gate. It's, it's very much Doctor Who being Doctor Who and doing something different, which I like. Next on the list is Megalos. And yes, I have Megalos higher than Caves. I like Megalos. I just find Megalos a good story. I like it. It's the one time when the doctor, when the actor playing the doctor is also playing another character, and I actually enjoy it because it makes sense in the plot of the story for Tom Baker to be playing two different characters. Although I'm really surprised they talked him into the Megalos makeup. I figured he would have objected, but it looks sharp. I like the Megalos makeup. We also have Jacqueline Hill back playing a different character. That's pretty awesome. I enjoy the set design well enough. It's nothing special, but I like it. I like uh, the guy playing kind of the leader of the pirates. He's, he's good. I enjoy him. Uh, it feels like it needed to be a little longer to me. The ending is very abrupt. It just kind of happens and it's over. And I'm like, that's it? Where's the next episode? What do you mean it's only a four-parter? Like, the writer thought it was supposed to be a five- or six-parter, and at the last minute they told him it was a four-parter, and he was like, oh. So how's uh, Megalos coming? Well, I've got four parts done. Oh, so it's finished. What, what do you mean? Well, it, it is a four-parter. Right, it's finished. I'll have it there tomorrow. <laughs> it's kind of what it seems like happened. I really wish Megalos was like one episode longer just to have had a more stretched out ending. Stretched out's not the right word, but that it hadn't ended so abruptly. That's really my only complaint with it. Uh, I wish it was one more episode longer. Next on the list is The Happiness Patrol. I enjoyed this one a lot. It is great satire, great fun. Love the set design. Like it looks kind of ridiculous but the whole idea of the story is ridiculous. So that kind of fits. That's the whole point of it being satire. It's so hard to do satire when the world is the way it is in 2023. But back in 1988, you could still do satire and pull it off. It's great satire. I love the sets. I love the actors. The actress playing Helen A does a great job with her. I never really cared for the stuff with her dog. I mean, it's, it's, it's vital to the end of the story. But other than that, I never liked her dog or its design. Um... I love McCoy's speech when he's daring the guy to shoot him, go ahead, pull the trigger. McCoy gets some great speeches, some very underrated speeches. Uh, he is absolutely phenomenal in that scene, though. Uh, I'm trying to remember what all Ace gets to do. The Candyman itself stuff doesn't quite work for me. I'm not a big fan of the actual use of the Candyman. But again, the story is absurd. It's an absurd plot, so having the Candyman there doing what the Candyman does is absurd, but that fits. It's what makes the story work. The whole idea that it's illegal to be happy um, is just a silly concept. And then I love that Helen A gets exactly the ending she deserves. I like the fact she doesn't get killed. She gets the exact ending that she deserves. It's an ironic ending. I like it. And then the fact that even, um, <clears throat> even her husband leaves without her. I, I really like the Happiness Patrol. It's a well-made well story. Gets its point across very effectively. So, crossing into the top ten, we're going to talk about the two doctors. I like the two doctors. Is it perfect? No. Uh, is it too long? Arguably too long. With It's a three-parter at 45 minutes apiece, but it is just so great <clears throat> seeing Troughton back again. Troughton always steals the show. Even though we don't get enough of Troughton in this, I love him in it. I love the introduction being in black and white and fading into color is a nice nod to his era. I love having Frasier back. In the very beginning of the story, when we really have the second Doctor and Jamie running around for a minute, it actually feels like a little mini second Doctor adventure, and I like that. That's nice. I like the bit when the Doctor reaches behind him like he's feeling for a knife and he just pulls out like the cucumber or whatever it is. It's very second Doctor. It's very second Doctor, and I absolutely love it. 
Uh, I love the fact that Jamie and the Sixth Doctor seem to get on really well. I like when the Sixth Doctor and Jamie and Perry are together. That's actually pretty neat. I enjoy that. I like seeing the Sixth Doctor without his jacket for a good portion of the story when he's just kind of wearing the suspenders and he doesn't have his jacket on. I like that look for him. Um, I think uh, my mind is going blank, but the actress playing the creature in it from Blake 7, my mind is at the moment on that. She's doing a good job in this. The guy playing Destari is doing a really good job in this. I never really cared for the angiograms, their design. I mean, the actor playing the main angiogram guy is doing a great job, but I never cared for their design much. And I really don't like the waiter who does the bug catching, who has the overly exaggerated death that takes so long. I'm sitting there going, just die already. Would you just die so we can move on with it? The location work looks really, really good. I think the, the sets for the space station look really, really good. It's just a good story. Not perfect, but a really good story. Next on the list is The Keeper of Trocken. I like this one. The last truly great Tom story, or very good Tom story at the very least. Uh, a great introduction, a great reintroduction of the master. It's good to bring him back. Only the second time he's shown up in the Tom Baker era. Uh, wonderfully performed by Jeffrey Beavers. Uh, it's <clears throat> introduction of Nyssa. I like Nyssa. Anthony Angley's best performance in Doctor Who, in my opinion, playing Tremus, uh, because I believe his production is, his production, his, uh, portrayal of Tremus is so good that it makes it all the more upsetting when he's basically killed by the master, when the master takes possession of his body. I like the set design a lot. Um, I enjoy Tom in the story. I love the little humorous bits between Tom and Adric at the beginning of the story. It's pretty funny. I don't really care for when the girl puts on the collar. First off, that little collar they wear looks, <laughs> it looks like one of those little slap bracelets you used to have that you slapped on your wrist. They look silly. And then when she shoots the beam out of her eyes, and you can tell it's the painted on eyes. I always hate the painted on eyes in classic who. They look terrible. Image of the Vendal <laughs> has the same problem. Uh, so it's a good story with a couple little flaws, uh, but I still find it very enjoyable. And next is The Mark of the Rani, my favorite sixth Doctor story and the highest on the list in eighth place. It's great that we get a sixth Doctor historical. <clears throat> this is really the only one. Uh, I, <clears throat> I absolutely love the Rani. I think she's a great villain. I love the fact that she's not just a female master either, all due respect to Missy, who is great. But the Rani operates differently than the master. She's more brains than brawn, which really didn't become apparent to me when I saw time, but when I watched Mark of the Rani, it really became apparent to me. She's a planner. She's the spider in the web. I mean, she's not afraid <clears throat> to get out front, but she doesn't want to obviously be out front. She's like, she operates from the shadows while still being on the front lines. You just don't know she's on the front lines. The way she's disguised as an old woman at the beginning. It's really well done. I do love the fact that the master himself is in this story because you can see the differences in how they operate. How they're antagonist in different ways. And I like how they're both brains, but they're brains in different ways, but the master is also brawn. He's brain and brawn. Like when he snatches her little thing away from her and threatens, you know, not to give it back and there's not much she can do about it. Colin's putting in a good performance here. <clears throat> I love that bit about, what do you do? Argue mainly. I like that a lot. Uh, I enjoy the incidental music in this story a lot. It's really, really good. Uh, the bit with the tree. <coughs> My sinuses are all over the place with the weather shifting as much as it is. Like 85 degrees, 55 degrees, 85 degrees. The weather in Mississippi is schizophrenic. Um, the bit with the little tree, the human tree thing, that's weird and doesn't age well. But other than that, I find it a very, very enjoyable story. Next on the list is Ark of Infinity. I like Ark of Infinity. Is Ark of Infinity objectively better than Caves of Androzani? No. I don't think so. I think Caves is objectively a better story, but I like Ark of Infinity. One, it's got some Michael Goff in it. I love me some Michael Goff. I do. I actually do enjoy the story, though. I think it's a great way to bring Omega back and how it keeps you in the dark about it being Omega for so long. 
That's the reason why the costume is so different. His personality is different. Uh, the actor playing him does a much better job of playing him more calm and reserved and not quite as <clears throat> bombastic. I like the performance better here, actually. Uh, the costume design is fine, although the costume of his sidekick, the Arato or whatever, is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the updated effects really help this one. Like, the original effects aren't that great, and I can see why it would detract from the story. But what I always recommend is if you don't really care for Arkham Infinity, try watching it with the updated effects. It, they really improve it a lot. Um... Especially with the laser blast, and you guys know Prowl likes him some up late, some upgraded laser blast. I really, really do. Uh, I love the location work at Amsterdam. I mean, it's kind of just there, so they can run around Amsterdam. But I like it. I like Davison playing dual roles close to the end, at least part way through the end. I enjoy that. <clears throat> it, it does make you feel very sympathetic for towards Omega in a way, which Three Doctors did too. But this one also does that. Uh, I absolutely love Colin's acting as Maxwell in it, too. I just, I do. I don't think Maxwell's a bad guy. He just takes his job very seriously. There's nothing malicious in what he does. He's just very much that militant, do-as-you're-told type. I'm just following orders, exactly. Uh, I, I don't ever get the sense he takes any kind of pleasure from it. He's just doing what he's supposed to do. Um, I think good performances all around. And Nissa gets stuff to do. Nissa gets stuff to do. I love that Nissa gets stuff to do. She's over there shooting things, and yeah, this is a great story if you're a Nissa fan. I'm always curious what uh, Josh Snares thinks of Ark of Infinity, since Nissa actually gets stuff to do. I'm really curious about that. Next on the list is Ghost Light. You guys know Prowley likes him some Ghost Light. Atmosphere, tension. Oh, atmosphere is so thick you can cut it with a knife. I love the setting of the house. <clears throat> Great studio setting. I love the dim lighting. I just love that it drips with tension. The casting is absolutely perfect. A lot of the characters, like the wife and the daughter, feel off. <clears throat> just off. So it, the cast is just so good in this. Uh, the story about evolution and all that is a little weird and it can be a little hard to follow on a first watch. It's got some neat concepts in it. The effects for light are really impressive, especially for classic Who. It's interesting seeing McCoy without his hat for most of the story. And um, <clears throat> watching Ace kind of have to confront her fears of the house. This was actually the last uh, classic Doctor Who story film. This was the last one they, do they did in production order. The order just got moved around when they aired. Um, and it's a good one. I really like Ghost Light. It's a, it's a good one to go back and watch on Halloween or any time, really. Moving into the top five, we're going to start with Four to Doomsday. I love Four to Doomsday. It's such an underrated story. I know it's all studio bound, but I love it a lot. Some of the dancing scenes, the musical scenes go on a little too long, but I love Davison's performance in this. He looks like he's having a ball. I know it was the first one he actually filmed. But he looks like he's having a good time. <clears throat> he has the most, one of the most killer smiles I've ever seen. I love when he walks out of the TARDIS and he just has that amazing smile he does when he notices the camera. Like, he's just so excited to be exploring. And, you know, he's the doctor. He wants to travel and see things. Hey, there are people here. I love that smile he does. We get to see him use his Sonic because uh, he doesn't have the Sonic very long. So we get to see him get some uses out of it here. I, um... <clears throat> I talked about Fort of Doomsday not too long ago, so I'm not going to go on about it here, but I love the cliffhanger of this Doctor is me with the chip. The effect of him doing the mask thing is a little classic who he dated, but the idea of it's impressive and the idea that they've been converted into the robots is a cool, is a neat feature. I, I like that. Although beating them by ripping the chip off is a little too easy, but the only reason they know the weakness is because the one guy showed it to them. Um, I like a lot of stuff going on in there, even if Adric himself is very annoying in it. <clears throat> is State of Decay, my favorite of season 18. You guys know I love State of Decay. It's a great vampire story, another great Halloween story. And a nice throwback to the Hinchcliffe era, gothic horror style. I think the execution of it for the most part is pretty good. 
Uh, I still think Tom's putting in a good performance. I mean, I know people will point out him and Lala won't even look each other in the eyes. They're at a rough patch right here while they're filming this. <clears throat> <clears throat> but I think he's putting in a really good performance overall. I like the design of the castle and how the idea of the castle being the old ship and then the vampires being the crew. Uh, Adric, once again, is a tad irksome in this one. Not as bad, but the fact he, once again, for the Doomsday and State of Decay, he, he like falls for what these people are telling him where he's <clears throat> at least temporarily tempted by them. Uh, the, the biggest problem is a couple of the effects need updating, like when they're, like when they use the little x-ray scanner and it shows the vampire flapping down below there, that looks pretty terrible. And then the ending shot when they kill the king vampire with the rocket going up, coming down and slaying the vampire, that looks naff. That's easily the weakest part of the story. But then you have the effect of <clears throat> when the three vampires die, the big three the effect of them aging and dying is actually really impressive, especially for Classic Who. Really impressive. I like that. Plus, I love the performances of the three vampires. It's a very theatrical performance, almost like it belongs in 60s Who, but it fits for me. For some reason, it works in the story well. Like that one time when the female ones... Somehow, I like it. It just clicks properly for me for them to be acting like that. I enjoy that. I love State of Decay. Uh, easily the best of season 18. Number three on the list, Curse of Fenric. I love Curse of Fenric, especially the um, updated version. I think it's the movie length format, not just because it has the updated effects, more because the color grading works better, where it's sunny at the beginning and more cloudy and dark toward the end when everything's going to pot the way it's supposed to be. I know when they were originally filming it, weather conditions didn't make it work right. The sunny parts were cloudy, the cloudy parts were sunny. So I like the fact it's color graded to work the way it's supposed to in the context of the story. I love the performances in this. I mean, we get Nick Parsons. Uh, I don't actually know a lot about Nick Parsons, but I know that's a big deal. And he was like a big game show host back in the day. So while I'm not British and not overly familiar with him, I know it was a big deal for him to be in this. Although I am a little frustrated that his character died the way he did. I kind of wish he hadn't died. Um, I'm still a little grumpy about that. I like the two girls that get turned into the hemovores or whatever they're called. Uh, the actresses playing them did a really good job of when they're human and when they're vampires. Come play with us. The one soldier they get in the lake deserved it because he's an idiot. You see these two girls with really long nails in the water looking creepy. Come play with us. And he's like, rightio. And I'm sitting there going, bye-bye. Bye-bye, soldier dude. You deserve it. <laughs> I do love the fact that the two girls go back for their kind of stepmother or matron or whoever that is i absolutely thought it was uh there's enough left in them to be like yeah we're gonna go back and get her we don't like her uh the design of the what, hemovores or whatever they are is really good with the crustaceous look to them like you know vampires from the depths that would be a really good name for a doctor who episode vampires from the depths i like that uh but i just love the makeup design on them it's really good the actor playing the older professor guy in the wheelchair is doing his part really good. The one military soldier who has the strong faith with the emblem or cross, he's putting in a good performance. Once again, you have the seventh doctor being Chess Master McCoy manipulating events. Sophie's putting in a good performance as Ace. <clears throat> and um, what the seventh doctor puts her through at the end, which mirrors kind of what Eleven puts Amy through in the God Complex. Except for it's done better here, because this one's a better story. Curse of Fenric is essential watching. I mean, if you ever want a handle on the Seventh Doctor, I'd pick this one even over Remembrance. It's just, it's this is the Seventh Doctor. Really good story, really good atmosphere, very creepy. The top two are interesting, because number two on the list is actually my favorite story by the Fifth Doctor. Like, if you were to ask me what's your favorite Fifth Doctor story, I would say number two, which is Castrovalva. Uh, I really love Castrovalva. It's just a good story. It's the end of a trilogy, while also being the Fifth Doctor's first episode. I like a lot of the concepts and ideas in it. I love the town of Castrovalva. It's just a fascinating idea. 
Uh, I love Anthony Ainley as the Patrive because I didn't realize that was Anthony Ainley. I'm always going to give it points because I didn't realize it when it was happening. Uh, it wasn't until the actual reveal of, oh, it's the Master. I was like, oh, it's the Master. They, I'm like, okay, the one time they actually got me. <laughs> uh, I love the updated effects on the box set because the original effects always were a little lacking in places, especially at Castrovalva. The updated effects do help it a lot. And, uh, and in other parts, like uh, when they're escaping the Big Bang, I like the fact they fixed the doctor's question marks on his collar when he's floating in the zero room. They were backwards originally. I like the fact they fixed that. It's a nice little thing. Um, the location work looks good because it is their surviving film elements. I just really enjoy Castrovalva. It was the first Fifth Doctor story I had on DVD because I bought the New Beginnings box set, which had Troc and Legopolis and Castrovalva in it. Again, it's a nice little trilogy. Um, and I really, really, uh, really like it. And number one on the list is the Five Doctors. I do like the Five Doctors. While I prefer Castrovalva over the Five Doctors personally, the Five Doctors is just such a good story. Uh, the plot is a little thin. It's still, it's not paper thin. I think the plot is fine, but it's not the most right. Like, Caves has a better plot, let's be honest. But The Five Doctors, more so than any anniversary special, and it's not my favorite. Three Doctors is my favorite anniversary special. But Five Doctors, I think, does a better job more than any anniversary special or anything even close to an anniversary special of really celebrating everything that's come before. You have returning Doctors, returning Companions, nods to the past, tying it in with the Time Lords and Rassilon. It celebrate. it really feels like a celebration of Doctor Who, not just the current era of Doctor Who. You know, Day of the Doctor really felt more like a celebration of eight years of modern Who, more so than it did all of Doctor Who. Um, whereas the five Doctors really does a good job. I mean, you bring back every Doctor, at least in some capacity, because you do have a little bit of Hartnell and Tom in there as well, even if it's just briefly. And especially since Shada wasn't really released publicly yet, that actually worked for the time, having the bit of Shada in there. It doesn't quite work as effectively now because we have Shada, but for back then in 83, that was actually a really clever idea, I think, as a way to work Tom in using basically unseen footage. <clears throat> uh, and getting Hartnell at the beginning was a great way of getting him in there from Invasion of Earth. I think Richard Herndl's putting in a good performance as the first Doctor. Troughton is stealing the show as always. Pertwee is great to have back. Uh, Sarah Jane is written very badly in my opinion. Uh, I don't feel like she really has anything to do. She's just kind of there. I'm a little disappointed with how she's written. Uh, I do like having the Brigadier there. Again, he doesn't really have much to do, but I like having him there. It's nice that we get Liz and Jamie and Zoe and, and uh, Yates briefly, even though it's not really them. They're, it's, they're glorified cameos, but I'm glad they're there. We get a little shot of K-9. It really does a good job celebrating all of Doctor Who up to that point, more so than any other special. I love the location work. It looks really good, especially on the box set. Uh, it looks gorgeous in HD. I love the new updated effects for the 40th anniversary. That is the definitive version for me to watch now. But I love the fact I have three different versions. I can pick which version I'm in the mood for. But the 40th anniversary is definitely, definitely my favorite. Neil did a great job. I hope they get Neil back to do more uh, updated effects. I really would because he was just seemed to have a little more of a polish to them, just like Revenge of the Cybermen did. Uh, I just love the extra little mm, he puts into his. So I feel like Five Doctors takes it because it really does feel like the 20th anniversary more than others. And it's just such a joy to watch. And it wraps itself up pretty nicely. And it's got a nice little twist with Verusa being one of the good guys up to that point, being the villain. Because if it had been the master, everybody would have been like, well, yeah, of course. But with it being Verusa, I think for the time that was a good twist. This is, is Verusa's first appearance. <clears throat> And he had always been a good person and deadly assassin in Invasion of Time earlier that season in Ark of Infinity. So it is something you don't really see coming. And I think it was done really well. Love the five doctors. So that's my list. Again, not all of it is objective or yes, caves would have been higher. But uh, and a lot of it is more personal preference and what I like and rewatchability and all that. But that's my list. I want to know what you think of it. Comment down below and let me know how you would rank them. Other things to do, don't forget to click the like button and the subscribe button, the bell for notifications as well. I also have a Patreon. If you like what I do and would like to support what I do, there's a link to that down in the description below as well. Several different tiers there to choose from. 
I want to give a shout out to some of my top tier patrons, Stephen Crane, Colin Coney, and Finn Perkins. I do appreciate their support, as I do the support of all of my patrons. It does make a difference, and it is appreciated. I also have a P.O. box if there's anything you'd like to send me to look at and review. A link to that is down there as well, as is a link to my Amazon wish list and my Amazon UK wish list as well. Also have YouTube memberships available if anyone's interested. Most importantly, though, thank you for watching. Thank you.